Divine will flow in through us, will dissolve and eliminate all those conditions that interfere with normal and harmonious flow of 
Tom God. Divine will. Flow in through us. Will strengthen. And rebuild. All those conditions. That interfere. And are necessary. For a normal and harmonious flow. Of Tom God. Instead, said, it is done, so be it. Om, 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 Om. Thank you. Energy. Yes, uh, we'll just have some questions and answers concerning what we covered in the last two days. Anyone wants to ask some questions? Yes. If there is no perfect marriage. If there is no. If there is no perfect marriage. If there is no perfect marriage. Then the uh, experience is for learning. The experience this far is learning. Yes. You see, perfect marriage does exist. It exists when two individuals grow together in consciousness and are able to lock in in consciousness. The present living master Charan Singh when he was a boy his grandfather told him he was going to get married he says no 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 I don't want to get married I want to renounce the world I want to go up and be a lawyer and renounce the world grandfather laughed when he was going to school one day there was a disciple of the grandfather who had a young daughter and the daughter said to the grandfather her own father she said I want to go and see the great master by the way train So the father says, no, the train don't stop at this spot, and we can't stop and see the great master. She says, I want to go and see the great master. And she kept on this other little child and kept on stamping her feet. When the train came towards the junction where the great master lived, but it doesn't stop there, the train began to slow down all of a sudden, and what that moved? It came to a grinding halt. The wheels are turning, but the train would not move. The engineers came out, and they couldn't figure it out, <coughs> so they had to let the people off at that junction. So the girl said to her dad, well, we can go and see Great Master, because the train will be ready for several hours. So they went up to see the Great Master. While they're coming into the compound, Great Master was holding some tango, and he had his eyes closed. He walked in and looked around, and he opened his eyes, and he saw her, and he said, Why do you bother me with such things for stopping the train? 
Uh, he had never seen a girl before. She was a very young girl. And she ran up to the great master and said, Great master, I want to be initiated. And everybody jumped, No, no, master, don't initiate her, she's too young. She's too young, she's a girl. He looked at everybody and he said, All right. And he started initiating her. Before he could even touch her, she was starting to see the light and hear the sound currents. So, she was describing all the realms verbally allowed to everybody, realms that they, the others that had never been to. And they began to realize that here is somebody who is a very unusual person. The oldest disciple of the great master who had been all to the highest realm. When, he, when she started to describe that realm, he perked up his ears. Well, just then, the grandson is coming in. After the great master fish initiated the girl, and she was standing there with her father, the grandson came in to pay respects to the grandfather, and the grandfather says, there's your wife. No, no, ma no, no, grandfather, I don't want to get married. Uh, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be a renunciate. Don't worry, that's your wife. So he says, grandfather, she's got a, if I got to marry, she's got to follow me all the way up to where I can go in my spiritual life. And she can't follow me there, I don't want to marry her. Grandpa said, that's going to be your wife. So he sat down there and started to meditate. And the girl sat down and meditated at the same time. One hour passed. He opened his eyes. He shook his head. He says, all right, grandfather, I accept. There was not a region he could go that she could not go. She went every region he could go inside. He accepted them after college to get married. My grandfather married him. So a perfect marriage does exist. When the female form has the same power drive with the male form in the inner life, then perfection is possible because they're interlocking now on an inner realm and an outer realm. Because any realm that he can go for inner consciousness, the wife would be there. So, marriage was made in heaven long before he realized it. Some of us go through life never wanting to get married or have certain information given to them about their marriage, when they will be married, who they will marry. And those individuals do work it out. I've met a few like that. There was a boy who studied with Yogananda. When I met him, he was a grown man and had two kids. But he was a boy at the time in Yogananda. And he wanted to be a renunciate. So every day he would go to church and meditate. And one day, Yogananda said to him, Boy, you're going to get married. He says, Master, I don't want to get married. I want to ask you what is my future. So the master looked at him and says, Your future is that you get married and settle down. He says, But I want to be a minister. I want to unfollow the path and teach. Says, you'll get married and settle down. The boy was disheartened. Anyway, when time went by, he said, Master, if I'm going to get married, would you pick the wife for me? He says, Divine Mother will pick her. He kept on attending classes 
And while he was sitting in front one day, listening to the master on a Sunday, there was a woman with her daughter came in. They were sitting right behind. And the master had finished lecturing. They looked around after the meditation, and they were all going to go out. And he said to the boy, that's your wife over there. So the boy looked at the girl. He never met. No, master, that can't be. That's your wife. They're coming out to the church and they're going up to the restaurant to eat. He's busy running up the step. He slips on the stairway and he's falling backwards. And who should catch him by the seat of his pants? The girl prevent him from falling on his head. What can he do? They're married and they have two beautiful children. From that incident, it, a budding romance grew into a beautiful marriage. But you see, guidance from those realms or from those individuals can lead us to the perfect marriage. That's why in the ancient days, they used to resort to the priest or the master to find the wife or the husband. to straighten them out, to understand themselves. So perfect marriages do exist. In just a few instances, a lot of them. Now when you say perfect marriage, we must clarify this. That does not say that they don't have their moments of uh, confrontation. Master's wife is a doctor, a naturopath, and she tells him off where to get off with his health. He, he has diabetes, and she regulates his diet and everything, and his clothes and everything, <laughs> his writings. <laughs> and he's a Sagittarius, and she's a Taurus. Here. Yeah. So it's interesting, <laughs> but the, it's the love that uh, resonates from inside that they can lock inside. The outward life is comical when you see it. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful to understand that masters who are realizing consciousness or they live through a, a comedy life on the outer realm. <laughs> like the colonel once said. He had a Volkswagen. They were driving around all these years, and the wife started to pray for a bigger car. And after they got the big car, it cost more to, to take care of the car. <laughs> no, they don't want it. <laughs> That's the comedy of the whole thing. They have a perfect match. No, his wife is not a vegetarian. But she would make sure that he has all the vegetarian food. But she loves her smokes, her snaps, and her good steaks. <laughs> Interesting, huh? <laughs> well, that's a perfect marriage. You see, at least she is not condemning his uh, way of life. She's making sure that he's got his, uh, his way of life and doing it a very good job of keeping him that way. This is what you're looking at the perfect marriage. It's not tearing the other person down. It is understanding the other person's way of life and catering to that way of life and let them respect your way of life and you live yours. Without that, it's that mutual respect for what the other person wants to be or do. You're talking about Colonel Burr, right? Yeah. You know, he told me that he says, my wife makes sure I have everything meticulous. Not, she makes sure that there's no egg or nothing. She reads the labels a hundred times to make sure there's nothing there. <laughs> she says, but she loves her little schnapps. <laughs> 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 
the first time I met them, you know, it says, uh, Cornish, you uh, ever use cigars? Oh, cigarillos. <laughs> No, but perfect marriage is not necessarily what we think that the other individuals got to toe the line of where we're going. Okay. There is that growth between individuals. As long as each one understands we are human beings, we've come through many aspects, and we're a long way to go concerning the physical body and the male or the female. So when we get into some more details tomorrow, we'll see some interesting facts of the behavior between husband and wife. On the cycles that people have, like the menstrual cycle for women and the moon cycle for men, when they marry, is there such a thing that they affect each other and, and form a third cycle? Yes, they form a third cycle of uh, anticipation. You see, the, that cycle sets up tremendous anticipation or anxiety because the, the man or the male body cannot sense effectively the rhythm of the female body. There are very few men in civilized society can do that. In a primitive society, the male body can sense it accurately like a machine. Because in a primitive society, the male body is trained to use a nostril. In a civilized society, this is one part we, we have actually brought the point of a trophy. Only a good pharmacist can use his nostril properly or a chemist. The nostril is the registering agent of the changes of the rhythms in the body by the odor. And these are the first indications of the rhythms that they are changing. Your own body odor changes too, and a primitive woman can sense that. Now I've read of a case of two friends who were missionaries, and it was very embarrassing for them to live in a primitive area with the people, and because they the natives could always sense their body rhythms and their body changes and they could always know when they had some uh, uh, intercourse with each other. It's a peculiar phenomenon because they could actually sense, uh, relate this thing, even if they took a bath and perfumed themselves. The one uh, woman would tell the, the missionary's wife, had a good time last night? <laughs> <laughs> and this can be pretty embarrassing, you know. Uh, uh, simple people, but what you can do? She, she said, but how can you know that? She said, well, we smell it. And the, the male body was the same. He would be there with the garden, the garden was talking and working, and the male gardener was telling about himself. Facts that he himself was pretty astounded. You understand? Yeah, it's simple by the smell that they were, he was able to relate this body uh, condition. And he began later on to take note of it because he says this was too, uh, too uncanny. Because he, after noticing it, he realized there must be some value to it. Because they were able to pinpoint when he was out of phase or he was going to end up in an argument with his wife or his wife was going to end up in some argument with him by the, the, the depth of the odor and the changes so after a while he began to observe himself and notice these changes in the body now in the first few days when the male body is changing, when the cycle is coming on, his breath is very foul. But he doesn't notice it. The wife is the first one who smells it. 
It always smells like if he's close to a wharf. Yeah, like a fish wharf. Now, when the woman's body is changing, the husband notices it. And he also smells like if he's near a wharf. He doesn't know why. Because it's salt. The body's chemistry is involved with salt water. The saline solution, the blood. These changes throw off the odor. The sodium chloride in the body is throwing off. And these toxins come out through the breath because that's how it has to escape out when it's discharged. And this is record begins to be observed. Then the perspiration comes next. The not an interesting thing about the uh, changes of the man is that he gets the irritability starts to appear in the fingertips in the first 10 or 12 days the fingertips there's always that desire for tapping the finger you ever see someone uh, if you look at some uh, go in a restaurant and look around at male men or for a while and you'll always see one or two of them do like that constantly they're tapping their fingers and they're trying to and they're swinging their feet they are going through the 10th or 12th day of the cycle change and they're not listening to no music you, there's no nothing playing in a restaurant but they're busy tapping away and it's like a mechanical movement and they can be talking and totally oblivious of what's going on It's the, uh, it's the build-up of the sperm movement so uh, in the body, reaching a point, wanting now to touch out, and reaching out for manipulation, reaching out for contact or massage. It has, you see, the hands are tingling for it. So the human body has to be massaged. These are the way this stress is released, but sometimes it's released by tapping to get the stress out. So the male passes through those phases. Now, the drowsiness comes in towards the last part of the cycle. You find that you go to bed very groggy and you wake up with a very groggy feeling. Now, if you're not married, that groggy feeling starts to make you feel tired. So you begin to take either cigarettes or coffee or alcohol to break the stress. You want to go out to the movies. You want to go to some place of entertainment to break the stress. Otherwise, you get bored and groggy or sleepy, and like you're crawling all over the wall. Now, the problem is true with a woman. But in this society, it's easy for the man to go out and go and meet people so he may go to a club or a dance place or something to entertain or release himself or find some type of outward reaction any female it's not so easy unless they want to go to a nightclub you see or they have their uh, parties or uh, what you say group meetings they have to have some release some contact with other human beings so that tension is building up. Now, the male senses this. Now, if he's married and if the husband and the wife can sense this between themselves, it's coming on, they can work towards that perfect experience with themselves and release themselves. But if they can't, then they're at variance, they're irritable. Slightest little thing aggravates them. For instance, they can be driving in the car and they're going out and it's the wife who knows where they're going. And she'll be sitting down in the back, on the side of the car or with a friend talking and the husband is driving. 
up to a certain point where he knows where he's going, but then he may not have all the details clear in his mind, then he's going to get pretty angry where he has to turn. And he can snap re reactions. He's going to go into what you call psychological tantrums. Right there and then, it's going to be very abrupt and sharp. Even right in front of the friend, you can't help it. Even he wants to be diplomatic, he can't help it. It comes out very crude out of his mouth. He can't <laughs> hold it back. And when she answers back, because of the tremendous shock, she's act answering out of phase, and the answer's coming back sharp and cutting. And it cuts very sharp, because this is something going on between the two mechanisms. Now the third person is in the middle looking on and they may have their own stress points and then they are trying to soften the point of which one to take side and which not to take sides. Now if it's another female in the in the car, you'll have the relationship of the female taking side of the female. If it's another male in the car, the male will take sides of the male. Now, if it's two couples inside a car, both of them are taking no sides. The husband and wife of the second couple will never take sides in the biting remarks of the other two couples because they don't want to get involved and they say, they'll say to themselves, they have to work it out themselves. And they'll be very naive and withdraw and be calm and relax, which is a very good thing to do and hope that these two people can relate, but not fully knowing why they are at each other's throat. Yet if they could recognize what is causing them to be at each other's throat, they could give the right statement or answer to their uh, conditions and those two people can break the tension and see why they're at, in that state. That is not the fact that one is not aware of where they're going and the fact that one is not considerate of telling the other individual how to get there. It is the fact that these forces, these cyclic rhythms in the body are blocking rationality in both of them. You see, these cyclic movements, these periodical movements, sets up certain electrical energy, certain chemical energy to block the rational thinking pattern of the individual, temporarily. But this, this is one level. There, you are planning on discussing later that there are things at another level that can stop this. Yes. Now, is this third phase picked up by the children? Yes. It's picked up by the children. The children can be in the back of the car and uh, the father may be driving and wants to have the instruction and then makes the remark, where do I turn? So the youngest child will cry without even uh, this, the wife being uh, resentful to the statement knowing it's a biting remark the child will cry, the youngest one will cry, will let out a, a, a scream or some kind of reaction because subjectively it's telegraphing to the child and it's picked up. Now the oldest child will start making some kind of a noise to distract everybody. Peculiar phenomenon. And that causes now more tension <laughs> the father <laughs> the father you know, start shouting at the child and the mother will have to start picking up and uh, please please listen to daddy don't get you know what I mean don't uh, disturb he's driving now and the mother is caught in the role of the pacifier psychologically what has happened the eldest child breaking their uh, tension between the two of them by some distracting action has caused now a lessening of the pressure. 
So the child has been used as a therapy shunt for the stresses between the two parents. Unknown to the child itself and unknown to the parents, physiologically and but electrically, the child has been used to shunt off that stress. Now, if the parent can recognize that by self-observation at night and realize what has happened during the day in the presence of the children, they can recycle this condition and correct it. But if they don't recognize it, then it starts building up. The elder child will gradually become more, we call it, aggressive in distractive actions and will become more stubborn. The younger child will become more timid and therefore a sense of pampering begins to take over. Then there is going to be a clashing now between the parents. The father is going to say, you're pampering the child too much and he's going to make the child shape up and stop his whimpering. And the mother is going to, the only thing the mother can do is put herself in the way and take any kind of uh, abuse just for the child. Yet the, the husband or the wife does not realize what really is causing it. It's being caused by these cyclic movements inside themselves coming to critical moments. How do you prevent these critical moments? I mean, <laughs> I mean how, how can you relieve the stress other than letting it get too, too the nutrition is one way you have to change your nutrition at the periods when the body is building up these stresses. Remember certain foods are, are like chemical bombs or what you add fuel to it. And if you remove that temporarily during those periods, the stress subsides down and doesn't have a high charge effect and the will of the individual can cope with it and balance it out. But if foods are used to some extent that would stimulate it, what you call the rajasic type of foods, the stimulant type of foods, you go and eating uh, spaghetti and uh, uh, lots of Mexican food, hot spicy food during that period, you'll find it becomes more stimulating. You have to watch the type of food that don't stimulate. You have to use cooling type of foods so that the body will cool itself down. It isn't that you should not eat the Mexican food or the spicy food. You can eat them at a different period of your cyclic movement, but at the critical moments of that cyclic action, you don't want to add more fuel to it because it gets abrupt. It starts snapping at you. You see? Now, is a male cycle pretty much like the moon, or does it vary like the female? Then that you can have it any time. I mean, once the, can they set their rhythm up at different times, like women? No, the male cannot set. His, that's the problem in the male. Okay, so the, it does come cyclically. Yeah, the female. Right, the female can set hers by the moon in 28 days. His takes 35 minimum sometimes up to 48 days so oh so it is longer yeah that's why he's more aggressive that's why he would always seem to be pursuing you for the, the feeling of relating to you sexually the drive is more that's why the condition is that when the female is satisfied once she doesn't want to be involved again but the male wants to be involved again because the energy is still pursuing, it's still going for, again, it's still maintaining its pull. Now, if the male hasn't been programmed by shock to what is called periodical impotent reaction, where this condition tapers off early for him, he would not uh, <coughs> go through that condition. You see, some of them do have that and then Instead of uh, being aggressive, they start tapering off. You see? Now, uh, there are moments when the female needs that uh, contact with the male during that cyclic period, and he has tapered off to an, an important shock, and now he's turning with his back and he's tired and listless.
Yeah. You can do that. Between 35 and 40 days. Yes. Now, when you said that uh, the children being a shunt sometimes, for the mother and father, you said that when you recognize at the end of the day that what the conditions were, that you could recycle it or cycle it out, will you be showing us during the retreat how to do that? Yes, uh, we, 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 that's what the whole thing is uh, based on. You're going through the whole household of life as a male body, female body, the children involved, and the, watching for the, the uh, rhythms and the periods of control and how to do your own house cleaning and consciousness with yourself and the children. Um, would you clarify this for me? The, the cycle that you by that, man or the woman? If the man has a cycle of 35 or 48 days, can he not claim to be affected by the means? Yes. He is. Yes. Well, how about women? Are, are, she too. Okay, they both are. They both are. Oh. But hers comes quicker. So she's affected twice by it. Right. Because of the menstrual cycle and the moon. Right. And he's affected by it twice, only to coincide with his 35 or um, You got it. So some full moons are going to be more drastic than others. Than others. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, what time of the year you think it's most drastic? Summertime. Why? Because, you know, there's 13 moons a year. Yeah. They're not 12 moons to a year. There are 13 full moons to a year. Therefore, their drive is always in the summertime. It's in the heat of the activity. The male body is more predominantly driven into a state of what you call horniness. <laughs> because of the 13 moons, the 13 full moons in a whole lunar year. And it's August, July. These are the most driving force period. That's why you find the beaches are flooded with all the, the, the male activity. Now, do we pick up uh, spiritual and psychic cycles as well? Like over a period of two or three or four years, it seems as if, you know, it can't just all be the weather. It seems to have ups and downs over this length of time too. Are we picking up not only uh, body, plant changes, and planet changes, and star changes, but are we also picking up psychic and spiritual? Yes, we're picking up psychic and spiritual changes in the individual because you have now, in the commitment of marriage between two individuals, you have a spiritual locking in to one another. The auras are locked to some degree, the commitment. So those uh, commitments are going to border on the extrasensory or the psychic or on the spiritual because the wife would not want to perform an action without first consulting the husband. And the husband would not want to perform action without consulting the wife because these are tendencies that are brought into focus when a marriage is consummated or accepted between two partners. She's got to know how much he's going to make and he wants to know if he's going to work or not or stay home. These are going to run into psychic uh, conditions. Well, but will it run into to psychic conditions from things that we don't ordinarily consider being around? Us? Yes, it will. You know, like, uh, I mean, really other spirits. Right, can. right. Because sometimes the man, right, the man can actually have a dream or some experience that can trigger off something more in the woman. And a woman can also have something that will trigger off in him. Okay. Now, so that the woman can be affected by man's dream. Yes. Yeah, oh, I believe that. Yeah. Especially if they're talking. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, it's very true. No, it's true. It's true. Oh, well, I don't, now, do all men have this terrifically? Um, Aggressive and violent dreams? I mean, is that natural for men? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. You know why? Because they're under stress, right? No. We really must be the, for our children. 
The reason why the male body is under the stress, it was the first form that took the shock when it was created. The female body was second that took the shock. Environmental shock. When the Lord created man, male and female, he created man first, the male form first. Then he created the female form second. These two forces came together, one after the other. The positive charge and the negative charge. The positive charge is a projecting charge. To understand that, let's turn up some light here and I'll show you. they got the rocket to line up themselves again to synchronize so that eventually the, the wave would look like this Positive has gone out and bounced it back with tentacles and returned to the source. That's why it's pulling back in. The negative goes out but doesn't pull back. It stays out with tentacles stretched out. Because it has to be set to polarity. They got to balance each other. They have to compromise to each other. So when they do line up, that's what the word is. Union comes back, that's why I said marriage is made in heaven, not like man. The unity of these forces triggered to come together, to line up, they make one B. That's where our problem is. That the male is suddenly exposed to the first shock by a positive charge. Therefore, he has what is called the, the drive for depositing and reaching out. Female has the drive for nesting or holding or locking anchoring, laying down the foundations. So in the female mechanism, the nesting quality is predominant than the male mechanism. The male mechanism is constantly facing shock waves. It's constantly 
and conquering shock waves. Now, in 24 hours, the male body is exposed to more shock waves by competitive reaction, by environmental exposure than the female body. The female body gets her exposure from interaction She doesn't get the shock waves from competing. She doesn't have to go and break the ice and create a, a new uh, empire. She doesn't have to go out and uh, try to show them that the world that she can build airplanes or to march across Africa to meet Mr. Livingston. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? She is not the empire building personality. It's the male body that does that, constantly seeking new frontiers, new exposures to shock. The female body is coming on behind, picking up the pieces and trying to make semblance out of chaos. That's why it's called a nesting force. But her shocks come from this disjointed chaos. Whereas in the male body, it's the their shock comes from the challenge. See? Now, the male would like to see the female more aggressive and less timid in front of a dog or in the woods with animals or in society with an automobile to bear that asphalt jungle and take on a little more uh, gumption because the male body thrives upon this aggressive interaction with the environment. It doesn't fear, so it doesn't want to be associated with something that tends to run from it. So these two are constantly are pulling. Now, when the female body takes on that type of activity, it can reach to a point where it can be over-domineering. And that is going to throw off the male mechanism now. The male mechanism is going to resent this domineering because it initiated it. That's why we say patriarchal society is afraid of matriarchal society. You see? The Amazons are powerful people when they became Amazons. <laughs> so the, the point is this. The male body will start to react if the female body becomes too over-dominant. It needs an equal partnership, yes, in facing the shock, but it does not need a, a one-sided action. Equally true, the female body is resentful of the over-softness of femininity in the male body at a certain point. If the female sees that the male is becoming too over soft and not standing up for certain things as a male should and then she has to assume that role of dominancy then there is breakdown between the two there is that conflict it is a fine line we walk of balance between the male and the female body that the male holds a certain line of dominance and pliancy and the female body holds the same thing otherwise they say She's too mannish and he's too womanish. This is the term to use to seem to pin down the, the behavior pattern. Is this driving force, this love drive and, and watching the woman uh, not like the drive and being afraid of things, is this why most men consider themselves smarter than women? Yes. I've cut my own throat. <laughs> <laughs> Are men smarter than women? <laughs> Well, or is it just that they think differently? Or is man basically charged positively and females basically charged uh, with a, now I hate to say negative because I don't mean bad, but on these ways, if electively speaking, now, what is the setup? The setup is that. The female body is designed to anchor itself to nature. That's why it's out 
see the wave out. It's anchoring out. It's uh, locking on to Father Nature or Mother Nature, which is it? Woman's body is designed to anchor itself to Mother Nature, which is the nesting principle. The man's body is not designed to anchor to Mother Nature, it's to get away from Mother Nature, take, take flight. That's why he's going into the planetary system. He's trying to get away from the gravitational pull all the time from the enclosing rings that holds him to Mother Nature. He's cutting himself free even from the apron strings, even if he says, touch me not and let it ascend it unto the Father. Even in the spiritual realm, he's breaking away from the anchor pull. This is the charge, that's how the charge works in him. It's on a pull out. So no matter how smart or intellectual anyone is, it is predominantly colored by whether they're male or female. Right. So your male mas masters, and they have female masters. Look at that female master over there. She's a female master, and there is one over here. Now this is a perfect marriage up here. These two are uh, husband and wives, Ramakrishna and his wife. And Ramakrishna was the highlight in the ashram in front of everyone because everyone bowed to him as a bright light. Yet in inner awareness, the wife was more evolved than Ramakrishna. But she never got the recognition until Ramakrishna passed out that she was a, a little more aware, inwardly, and stable than Ramakrishna. Now there are other forces reversed, taken her life. Her husband is not as evolved as her. She's far more evolved than her husband, and her husband is a very spiritual man. Now, in the case of this master, he's more evolved than the, the, the wife, but the wife can match him. She has the same driving capacity to match. Now, in the grandfather, he doesn't marry. So, women need a driving capacity to attain a higher spiritual life. Is that right? Yes. But you see, a woman starts off on a spiritual drive because of the intuitive feeling she has earlier than a man. A woman is more prone to be spiritual from an early stage of her life to the latter stage of her life more than a man simply because she relies more on her feeling. A man relies more on his reason and logic and therefore he's not so easy to be spiritual. He has a natural aversion to spiritual things because they are not tangible enough in terms of his drive for survival. His drive for survival is to break open new ideas, new frontiers, new thinking. So, it's difficult for him to be spiritual in the early part of his life. But he is relentless, more methodical in the pursuit when he decides upon it to the end of it than the woman. See, he brings with him his logic and reason to bear with his feeling. That's why you see of the male body can go through the, the privations of the spiritual life at a later stage than the female body. But she's already got the, the love and the the tenden the warmness and the tendency of compassion, all these things in the mother and the softness that she's accepted in that spiritual role. In the male body the coarseness is there in the early stages then he's got to taper off and become soft and warm. Now the same thing was happening to Yogananda's parents. You remember when you read Yogananda's parents, mother was always the one who taught them the bittersweet of the Bible. They learned their ABCs of what a spiritual life is, and daddy was cold, mathematical, and until the wife passed on, then Yogananda said he began to discern that his father was slowly metamorphosing into the qualities of the mother. Why? Because it, the adult life of the male now is starting to come up. The feeling nature was starting to rise like a thermometer within him. The methodical nature was starting to diminish because it ran its course. So it's not
now has to taper off. So you'll find that the male body, it's at a later stage, it becomes driving more predominantly. In the early stages, it doesn't. Unless the individual has brought this in his past life, into the present life, for this drive, that he'll immediately gravitate at an early age towards the spiritual life and pursue it. But by and large, the male body doesn't pull in that direction. See, the male body is dominated by a reason, primarily first, and second by feeling. The female body is dominated by feeling first, and then reason second. And the, the relationships of contact, the male body is dominated by eyes, female body is dominated by ears. Now, yet both bodies can maintain their balanced relationship by smell, which we ignore because we don't live in primitive societies no more. How do we develop that smell? Not develop, you have to re-educate it. You've already got it, but you've uh, shut it off. Stop using uh, deodorants. The, huh? <laughs> well, let me explain something, how you can re-educate that by order. You have to first observe yourself. how the body smells and you begin from the new moon the first part of the moon and try to relate to its odor your own body odor you have to try to relate it during the period of the new moon and then observe it when it goes in towards the uh, full moon then observe it going into the last quarter of the moon. See the first quarter, second quarter, full and last. You have to observe it within that 28 day period and then continue on to 35 days. In the meantime, you have to observe how your body feels in terms of the nerve endings in the sexual region, the irritabilities and the different exposure to the various female bodies that you have seen within that time, how your body re reacting. And observe that when you come in contact and see someone and you're stimulated by the eyes, how you breathe. Because you breathe a certain way, your body is secreting a certain odor. Because there's tension. There is that particular movement inside of the mechanism. Now, you see the advertisement in the, in the uh, TV and the uh, newspaper that says tension gives you body odor, therefore use deodorant. But the tension is the stimulation brought on by sight or hearing in both individuals. So if it's in the male body, the tension or the suspense, the anticipation and the denial, the aggravations are all producing body chemistry to the point where it can be noticed and you have to tag it and observe it. Then you're re-educating the nostrils for the first time. You may start off very foul, gradually tapering off to a musky odor. At the highest peak of the body's cycling, the, your body odor would be more like a, as I say, close to the uh, ocean, the saltiness of the body. Yeah, if you read uh, some of your uh, magazines where they talk about the seaman goes down to sea in a salty brine, feels himself strong and brawny and can take on the world, and he beats his chest and pulls his beard and looks at the spits of the wind. These are all body language communication of the peculiar body cycles. 
that, that the author is inadvertently writing and didn't recognize what he's doing, you know. He's actually describing how the male body feels when it lacks the, the contact with the female body. It's, you know, that's a peculiar really, sensation. If you really get good at that, though, you can tell by being around other people their reaction to you. Yes. Now, in a spiritual man's body, or in a spiritual woman's body, these odors now change to more softer, subtle odors, sweeter odors. These are the sudden changes in them. Now, this is the process of love now coming in, and the desire pattern from a physical nature is slowly shifting to a more aesthetic quality inside. Though that doesn't say that the male body doesn't have the physical drive or the female body has the physical drive, they both have, but the communication now is more tactual. The communication is based on touch. It's not more sight, it's not more hearing, it's not more smelling, but it's more touch. How you communicate on touch? Because in touch, frequencies are transferred, therefore we have now the tendency to transmit healing vibrations. The more the man or the woman becomes spiritual, the more the healing powers are flowing from a tactual nature. Now, you read the autobiography of a yogi. What was the first experience she had when he met him? When Ananda Moy Ma met Yogananda, these are two spiritual people. What did she do? She recognized him. Oh, she, she, she went out. Face. Yeah, she went out outside to see him. She was and she did what? Ginger said she touched his feet. Yes, tactual. And then threw her head, neck around him. And it's not customary for an Indian woman to do that. To embrace. The Indian woman never embrace. In open? No. You never seen any woman do that. She's she breaking all tradition. No Swami would even embrace a woman. These, these are custom traditional because their bodies are tactual. They're working on a tactual level. So you don't, they don't want you to touch them. Why did she do that? What was he thinking? <laughs> <laughs> A Swami would not let an ordinary person touch him too much on a tactual level because they may be draining the body energy and they may have too much uh, vibrations that are negative in them. Unless he wants it, then he will do it and work on certain karmic debts for them. But their consciousness is locked in a tactual nature. She is an evolved woman. He is an evolved man. When they met, she said these words, Father, I am meeting you for the first time in the body. And he says, yes, mother. He didn't see her as a woman, per se. He saw her as the cosmic mother principle. She didn't see him as a man because she was married. She saw him as the cosmic father principle. And now on a tactual level, they are making intercommunication. Yes. And she's hugging him around the neck. All right. <laughs> and you see how, how shy she was? Yeah, but she, in that picture, she is just a beautiful woman. Good. Now, look at, look, she's aged considerably in that. Is she much older than that? Oh, I think she's still right here. Well, she, look at the difference, though. It'll do pictures. Friend, Birthday. you say she's aged? She's not compared to that picture. How old is she in there? Ananda Moy is maybe in her, close to her 80s. In that picture? No, in that picture she's in her uh, 60s. Oh, well look at, look, I'll show you the picture in Autobiography. It looks to be in 30 or 40. Yes. But yeah, she was talking to And if you see her in a living body, she's supposed to come to this country. 
she's a very young looking person. I've seen pictures taken before and after, one after the other, they're never the same. I don't see, I've never seen pictures of any of these people that they're same, that you can capture the same, the same, they look the same. <laughs> because it's that peculiar phenomenon of life in them. They are working on tactile levels. So all the inner interactions is through the, that level. On that level. Is that why you have this tingling feeling in your hands more? Now you're recognizing, and that has a rhythm too. And when you're advancing on a spiritual life, you have you begin to recognize the rhythms of these movements. Sometimes you feel like if you just can't touch another person, you're just going to die unless you can touch your Yes. Body. Just to, to merely touch. Mm -hmm. A mother likes to touch her child. A child oh, likes to touch the mother. Yeah. Yes. That's why there's so much touching in this group. Yeah. We touch each other all the and time. And that is what breaks down the inhibitions and release the pressure in the individual and make him a, a whole individual for the first time. There is well, no. I like it. I like it. <laughs> 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 this is really, this is really lower. This, this accounts for the relationship at early birth when you first hold your child. Yes. That, that settles down all. All, the, all of their screaming and hollering. Right. Kind of the world. Well, that's what they like to do the most too. And well, they want the. No, I'm talking about it. Quite true. Child, immediate born child wants to be, that's why they should give the child to the parent immediately for fondling and touching. The tactual relationship is very important all through life. In the highly spiritual life between masters and their disciples, it's all tactual. It's constant touch. Yogananda, when he was in the body, he'd be always walking with his disciples and holding their hands. And one day, and he would always knock them on their head or touch them on the face or hit them with a the finger <laughs> or slap them. Okay. What is, is this the same principle when you, when you actually feel a touch that, that has not even touched you but has touched someone else? Yes. You see, we touch you with our eyes too, by Dasha. See when a darshan is going on, we are actually touching you by the waves of our eyes in the room. That's why you feel a peculiar wave going through the room. This is a higher form of tactual contact. See, in as much as a man is stimulated by sight and only is stimulated by hearing, and in the evolved mechanism now where the two are working into a spiritual growth and are making contact on a tactile level. Sight can touch you, and hearing can touch you now. This is peculiar. These are so subtle forces in the human body that you can touch a person by the hearing, and you can touch them with your eyes, and you can touch them with your hands. Let alone you can touch them in your thoughts now. This accounts for the eyes that you notice the first time. Yes. Darshan, I always do that. Besides, the last giddy blissful feeling sounds always great. Oh, that's touching you by the ears. Yeah. 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 Seeing properly, I see it. You see, unity or oneness. Is impeded by the five senses because we live in the human body. We are only in one in the energy fields, totally. But because we have a physical body, we are restricted to the five senses to see, to smell, to hear, to touch. So, a darsha is a very high form of factual contact with another being. That's why the woman said, if I would touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. This is what we're talking about, the tactile forces. And he felt it when he touched 
or naturally you have to feel it because that is a supernatural. You touch this, I can feel this if, if it's not a, uh, it's a bond between the two. If there's no homogeneous bond between the two, it's consciousness. So you can look at someone and radiate this love, and you feel that energy goes back and forth. That is tactile contact. <coughs> but in that tactile contact, there is a danger. In the unethical behavior of the individual, that's why the, the male body and the female body has got to learn a lot about themselves before they can be trusted with tactile contact. Oh, in looking and, 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 uh, and lust and other. Ah, you used the word I said uh, yesterday the most powerful force is not ego, lust. lust, because it's a very subtle one that can trip you up. It trips you up in the tactile relationship. Ego don't. There is no tripping up of your nature in an ego trip by a tactile action, but you can be tripped up by lust in tactile contact. Or well, ego is mainly just setting yourself up. Uh, uh, lust is trying to set another person up for your own. That's where the danger lies in tactile relationship on a level of the spiritual growth. That's why the masters do not want their students to touch too often or touch them too much because they may drop into that particular relationship of feeling a lust action. Right. Now, the person may touch another one and certain sensations come up in them that they have never had before and they may relate to those sensations as lustful sensations. So this is where the peculiarity in the tactual contact comes in. You see? Because you don't know, let's say you're married and your husband never touched you a certain way, and all of a sudden you meet someone and you get a tactual contact in a very honest, simple, innocent reaction, but in your mind it triggers some condition in your body that you never felt before, and this can suddenly lead to that particular sensation that you may feel a neurotic action. That can make your mind now start thinking in terms of lust. Because healing force is erotic. It has to stimulate energy in a spot to heal. And it will cause itching. If you want to rub the, the person's body that is sore, by the time you stroke that spot, you are setting into force many, many sensations. One, the release of the tension of the pain there, which is soothing, and if it's too over emphasized, it can lead now to the next sensation of erotism. And if it's too over emphasized, it can lead now to manual stimulation. You see, there are two subtle forces that are too closely related in a tactile condition. Now, if the energy released is not bringing on conditions like lust or erotic action in the body, and but it's actually soothing the individual and releasing the tension and the stress and raising the consciousness to, to the feeling of joy, then this is a safe factor of relationship. Because remember, a male and a female body makes contact, and the, the, the time they make the most significant contact is when they are in bed without any clothes. The naked body is making the most highest tactual contact. Therefore, these are exchanges of different types of feelings, both from the standpoint of lust or the standpoint of release. Now, the nearest thing to that would be a massage. The nearest thing to be with that would be swimming. But in swimming, again, water acts as a barrier to shut down the feeling. Only when you come out of the water and in the sun, then that feeling is raised up again. One seldom lusts in water, but he lusts more in the dry sun on the beach because of the peculiar phenomena of water. You can see the person in water and you may swim, but the drive in water is tapered down more than the drive outside of water. Because you're 80% water ready. 
and the body cools down faster in the water and it's, the heat is dissipated quicker in water. The tactual contact stimulates thermal relationship or heat, which brings about the feeling of lust. So if one were to have a good infrared camera and make studies on that, you, you'd come up with definite... You would come up with definite uh, uh, information as how the, the frequency of lust can, is triggered off. But then you can also see now the ethical nature of it. Remember Jesus embraced Mary and all the other masses embrace, but there is still that ethical force from the standpoint of love and the standpoint of healing. But it's, again, we have to be very conscious of the fact what this uh, other sensation can do, because that's the one that tricks us. He says, <laughs> one master put it this way, the devil will follow you right to your closest part of your bosom. In other words, Love comes from the heart, which is in the bosom. And when you embrace, you're bringing another person close to you. It says, it's so tricky a sensation that it'll get it right in that point between you and bite you. So tell me, when we're we coming to the thought uh, of sublimation, of learning the control? We can't come to that until we understand more of the body before we can deal with what is called sublimation of the forces for channeling it. We'll deal with that as we go on. In the, but we can't, uh, we can't jump. We have to cover these forces to understand why we are there. You see, a child loves to be fondled. And if the parent impedes a child from touching its body, it gets a shock. And then the shock registers into inquiry and into daring. And before you know it, the child veers off into an abnormal behavior. If the child is told to recognize that the body is a healthy mechanism and it's like it should be massaged and rubbed, it will never veer off into an abnormal behavior. It will respect the body because the tactual nature will develop correctly. We don't develop the tactual nature in ourselves. That's why we give our children back Right. <laughs> right. But you see, the thing is this. We don't educate ourselves that way. We don't use it properly, and therefore we end up deviating. Massage is very important. And it's a very important aspect. And we'll deal a lot with it because you have to understand why the cells need the tactile contact for it. All right, why does a man and a woman touch each other when they, they get married and then they argue what did they do? Do they ever want to touch each other after they argue? No. What is the sweetest time between a male and a female after they argue? What they call that? Makeup and kiss and makeup. But kiss and makeup is to touch out, reach out again to touch on a tactual basis. And there the spurt of the energy is increased more than the previous spurt before the previous argument. You can always measure that peculiar increase of the energy going out after an uh, argument between a male and a female and try to make up and reach out to reconcile the bodily forces. The bodily forces secrete a higher charge, a higher intensity rate after a confrontation. That's why they say the period of reconciliation is always the sweetest because it is the ever new joy coming through the cells after a confrontation. Now, this can get neurotic after a while because you figure out that every time you're happy after an argument, you want to set up more arguments. <laughs> so, but that's not, not, not the way to do it. After you reconcile yourself to the individual, it is learning now to taper and organize yourself with the individual. 
therefore the tactile part is very important to know how to be communicate with the tactile part. Do you short circuit something if you touch during an argument and stop it? Yes. You can stop the argument probably right away. You stop it by just touching the person. Well, but, but you're saying that, that's all right. Yeah. If you and the other person is arguing, if you and the other person is arguing, you know, and they get in the, to the point where uh, laugh and just be like, you know. <laughs> so remember this. We can't argue with each other if there was no breakdown in communication. Because the first time when you met, there was something in you that triggered the spark in him. And there's something in him that triggers a spark in you. But if that spark is never tactually connecting or retained all through your married life, then the argument.